Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm your host, the creator of the program, as well as that's Cat Herder, Brian Alexander. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here today on uh, a, an incredibly stressful, chaotic, fascinating, and uh, all too interesting time in higher education. Uh, we have a terrific guest today, but before we plunge into that, let me explain how the program works, where it comes from, and then I'll introduce this week's guest. So to begin with, the Future Trends Forum is all about conversation. The whole purpose of the forum is to host discussions between all of you, including a spectacular guest this week. I want to hear from you, your questions, your examples, your pushback, your criticisms, your exemplifications, all kinds of thoughts. The whole idea here is to have a forum of conversation and discussion. And we've been doing this for, well, we're in our fifth year right now. Now, the forum is part of an overarching project called the Future of Education Observatory. And this is an ongoing multimedia, multimodal attempt to grapple with the future of higher education. It includes a lot of different moving parts. One is this, our weekly program. There's also a monthly trends analysis called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report. Uh, this is a long-running trends analysis report, which goes back almost 10 years. Um, it's a Uh, just head to futureofeducation.us. Now, we can only do this kind of work if we have the support of some very generous folks, and we want to thank them before we proceed. To begin with, in New York State, we want to thank NizerNet, and that's a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities get online and do great work with each other. They have fantastic work with high-speed broadband and professional development, and we're really, really grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So let me just show you how this works, if you're new to it or if you haven't been here for a while. Where I am, and my cat apparently, and where this slide is, just for a moment, is called the stage. And we call it the stage because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on on the stage. Now right below us, you can see all around you a bunch of different well, they're basically avatars. You can see individual people, their live feeds, like, say, uh, Dennis Saulnier. You can see a few uh, photos or silhouettes, like R. David Rahm. And each of those represents one or more people signed in from somewhere in the world. Uh, right now, there are 42 of you. And in fact, one of the ways that Shindy works is that we break these into rooms. So as people pile in, they get segmented out into rooms of about 20. So if you want to jump around between rooms, you can just hit these buttons on either side of the room screen and you can you know, jump back and forth between rooms. If you want to say hi to an individual, just simply double click on their icon. And if their audio visual systems are on and they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audio visual conversation, which is pretty neat. But how can you participate in the conversation that I just talked about a couple of minutes ago? There are two major ways. Let me draw your attention to them right now. At the bottom of the screen, you should see a few different buttons lined up. Now, one of those buttons is going to be a raised hand, and one of them is a question mark. The question mark is if you want to type in a question or a comment. So it's really easy. Press the button, type in your question or comment, hit send, and I'll receive that. And when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen so that everyone can read it, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, people often do that if they don't have a camera microphone set up or if they're in a space like a busy office where they can't talk out loud. Now, if you have your microphone and camera on, if you have a space where you can talk, press that raised hand button. That tells me you want to join us up here on stage. It's really easy. I literally press a button and you know, up you appear on stage. So if you want to have face-to-face -face conversation with myself and especially our guest, that's all it takes. And it's easier to do than it's for me to describe, and I'll show you how that works. Now, if you want to also chat with everybody else, there's a chat box. So take a look at the button there. In fact, I often ask people to type in where they are today geographically, where they're coming from. It's a good way to say hello. So you can do that. So really, the question mark and the raised hand are the best ways to participate. You can do that all throughout the session. And we're really grateful to Shindig for inventing this technology. And we're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. 
Now, if you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like GoStarter, like Kickstarter or GoFundMe, and it lets you collaboratively support someone who's doing uh, work that you want to support. In this case, it's our work on the future of education. So if you head to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you can find a lot of ways to support us. The folks here contribute as much as $10 a month to support us, which is fantastic. We're really, really grateful to them for their support. Folks like Joanna Richardson, Matthew Trainum, uh, Sean Summer, Jeannie Kim Han, Lisa Pritchard. We're really, really grateful to them. And you can join them. Now, before I get into this week's uh, guest, I just want to put out one note. It's obvious that right now, the world is in a crisis mode thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, a uh, recently declared pandemic. And there's a lot to say about it. And you can bring this up if you like today, because I think you'll find our guest has some really interesting perspectives. If you'd like to see more about that, just head to this link, tinyurl.com slash COVIDEDU. That's where I have a few links to a resource page on how to track the spread of the pandemic, as well as the world's biggest spreadsheet of colleges and universities that are closing or migrating online because of the pandemic. So just click on that link if you'd like to learn more, and uh, I hope that can be useful. Now, even more useful is this week's guest. So let me just introduce our fantastic guest, Bernard Bull. Um, Bernard has been a guest before when he was in a previous position. Uh, he is now in a really extraordinary position. He's the president of Goddard College uh, up in Vermont. And he was brought to Goddard to, Goddard to save it from closing. Uh, this is an unusual unusual perspective that you have. Very rarely can you meet a college university president who is there when it's on the edge of existence, who is right now taking steps to make sure it survives. So what I'd like to do uh, is I would like to invite you all to ask questions of him. Um, I can assure you that Bernard is really, really approachable and friendly. Um, Bernard, you have time to uh, disabuse us of that notion. Um, right. It would be great uh, to hear your thoughts um, about this. So, to begin with, let me just uh, let, let me just say first of all, welcome. Uh, I'm really, really glad you could make it today. Uh, Thanks. It's great to be here. And and I have to ask a question of someone in the North Country, which is, since it's March, how's the weather there? Uh, Iran, actually, I'm in Wisconsin today, but I'm usually in Vermont. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I had lived in Wisconsin before. We still have a house here, and I'd come back. My family splits their time between the two states. So I don't actually know what the weather's like there. All of our meetings have been on Zoom. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I ask guests to introduce themselves, and I did this with you the last time you came on, which is a few years ago, I, I usually ask if you could just speak about what you're going to be focused on uh, for the next year. And what I'm guessing you're going to say is you're focused on making Goddard thrive. Um, why don't, right. why don't you dive into that and actually tell you what, better yet, why don't you introduce Goddard to us? Because it's an unusual institution. Sure. Um, so my kind of elevator pitch is that um, in the 1930s, the world was pretty much on fire um, in many ways with the growth of fascism in the West. There were serious concerns about the environment, um, although not the same as today. Um, mm -hmm. They're uh, was finding their way out of the all of the implications of the financial crisis of the, um, that had had happened prior. The time serious concern, and a group of people in central Vermont gathered together and had this vision inspired by John Dewey and other progressive educators of creating a very different kind of uh, learning community, a different kind of college that was not built upon the traditions of the past, but was instead embedded in the experiences and the challenges going on in the world at that moment. And so uh, most colleges, when they start, they look at another college as an exemplar, and then they try to build practices and models based upon that exemplar, and then maybe they put their own, their own twist to it. Um, Goddard was not. It was launched in the 1930s with a completely radical, different viewpoint. There were never letter grades. Um, there were no courses in the traditional sense. Every student designed their own personalized learning plan from the beginning. In the original charter in the 1930s, the vision was to be serving adult learners in addition to, at the time, uh, traditional residential students. Um, and uh, to have a radical approach to uh, a democratic community where the learners have a voice equal to that of the faculty and others. Uh, from the beginning, there, wasn't, there weren't ranks and promotions of faculty um, and titles, um, very different model. 
from there, the college grew and it had many iterations. There was a dream that it would it would not be dependent upon um, an endowment, but that it would be uh, tied to the needs in the world. And if it was meeting those needs, then it would do okay. And if it wasn't, then maybe um, it didn't deserve to exist. Wow. And um, and uh, that was Tim Pitkin, the first president. So they never spent a lot of time building an endowment, although there were several uh, foundations that gave key gifts at times. The Ford Foundation and others had had stepped in at, at different uh, different times and and given money. Um, the college had a, a variety of iterations. By the 60s, um, Evelyn Bates, assistant to the president, had gone to University of Chicago, did some work, came up with this completely new model for higher education called a low residency program. And the first low residency program in the nation was launched at Goddard College, where students would come for an intensive time and come back. It was a program, one of the first programs in the nation, uh, specifically for single mothers, trying to create that kind of flexibility. So um, th that was added to the repertoire, um, the mix in the 60s. And later in the two early 2000s, the college was going through a crisis, actually one, probably its fourth or fifth financial crisis by that time. Um, and um, it decided that its best way to make it was to shut down its residential program and to focus entirely on low residency, which is what it is today. And so students come for 10 day intensives um, and it's like a conference on steroids. I mean, they're from wake up to falling asleep, even if you do fall asleep. Um, I mean, it's, it's nonstop, but we bring in world-class uh, uh, um, authors and poets and activists and others who are part of the experience, very interdisciplinary. Um, a student in a given semester will oftentimes work with a single faculty member. So they, they design their own learning plan and they say, this is 12 or 15 credits worth of work. And they're assigned an advisor who guides them in their learning plan and in their work throughout the semester. So they propose that plan during their residency. They leave for the semester. And during that semester, they send packets of work and they get really detailed, rich narrative feedback, sometimes pages or dozens of pages of written narrative feedback from their advisor. Um, on their work through the semester. And at the end of the semester, they come back and it starts over. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's a little glimpse of the Goddard experience. One of the ways people like to talk about Goddard is many people who come to Goddard are um, in their mid twenties or older, and they've heard no and can't a lot in the education system. They've heard, no, you can't do it that way. We have these rules and policies here. And they get to Goddard and, and the shock is how many times they hear yes and can. And it really is, the learner is really in the driver's seat. They, their voice, choice, ownership, and agency are central to the model. The faculty member really is a guide. Um, truly, it, it's not, the faculty member doesn't dictate specific books or readings or anything. That's all negotiated or proposed or in, in, in a rich kind of uh, conversation with a democratic flair to it. Mm. It's, it's it's extraordinary. It, it really is. I mean, you, you've you've got a bunch of different strands of experimental learning from higher education. You know, the, I mean, the lack of grades, the narrative feedback. You have the uh, dis the, the the democratic structure of of organizing in campus. You have low residency requirement. I mean, it's really extraordinary. How many students um, um, are there right now in your program? Currently serve about three hundred and fifty students. At Goddard's peak, it was less than a thousand. So it's never been a large school. Okay. Um, but uh, but right now about 350 and it's been declining. In fact, uh, this current semester uh, is the first semester in eight semesters that we will have met or exceeded our enrollment targets. The way this semester meaning spring or fall? No, uh, this this uh, we're actually um, our last residency because our students uh, start. Um, so so our last residency for the spring is um, on the 20th of this month. Very good. Very good, congratulations. Um, friends, I, I have all kinds of questions uh, for President Bull, and um, uh, I, I just wanna start with one, but I really, really wanna hear from you. Uh, I wanna hear your questions about how, uh, how Goddard works, about the problems it's facing, and, and what he's doing. And as you can tell, um, President Bull is, is very, very direct. Um, the question I'll ask you, and this is a kind of, um, you know, uh, um, faux question in a way, well, given this, this sounds really appealing. Why, why did Goddard run into financial problems? What's, you know, what brought you to the edge of uh, the wolf? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I won't be able to give a full answer for that. It's it's messy and it's hard to tell sometimes. I think people speculate and they claim they understand what's happening in the current landscape of higher education. And there are these larger macro trends that we can follow and we can understand how things are working. But um, there's a lot internal uh, to this conversation as well. I can say that in recent history, we haven't been the best with managing our resources. Um, I don't believe that the financial model at Goddard that we've been operating from in the past decade uh, was sustainable. It was it was highly susceptible to um, fluctuations in enrollment that would jeopardize it. The college does has a less than a couple million dollars in an endowment, so it's very tuition dependent. Um, and um, really? the enrollment office had kind of uh, fallen apart over the last number of years. Uh, when, right before I arrived, I mean, this is the level of kind of where we were. Um, after several months, they discovered that the lead form on the website was broken. In other words, when someone inquired to learn about the college, oh. uh, it was going nowhere to um, fill out a form. So we're talking about some really kind of fundamental uh, challenges. Uh, the college had a couple million dollars in cash reserves, and its annual budget is only seven and a half million dollars at this size. Um, so a couple million, uh, you know, a one point uh, had a couple million in cash reserves, which is okay. A uh, nonprofit should have three to six months of its annual budget in cash reserves to be pretty stable. That way, it can handle a fluctuation in, in enrollment, and uh, if a roof falls in and it's not covered by insurance, things like that. Um, by the time when I arrived, I took the job. I actually thought that there were some cash reserves because I'd ask for financial documents, but those documents were a year old. By the time I arrived, the college was actually in a $1.4 million deficit um, with no cash reserves and no endowment. Oh, no. Seven uh, consecutive semesters of declining enrollment. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, when it comes down to it, it really did come to the basics. Did we have a viable financial model? And I believe the answer was no, that we were operating from a deficit budget. And that's part of why we were put on probation with the accreditors, because the accreditation agency looked at it and said, you know, you're um, you don't have a viable financial model and your board uh, should have been should not have been approving uh, deficit spending like that. The board should have have uh, demanded that you create a model where you operate consistently on a balanced budget. Hopefully you give me a chance somewhere in this conversation to share what's happened between 12 months or 14 months ago and now because it's kind of it's kind of fun and exciting. Although our chance of succeeding is still not um, guaranteed. I mean, we could be in September, October, I could be sharing pretty somber news. <clears throat> I think I lost Brian. I don't know if others can see Brian, but I just see a black box. So I feel like I'm alone on the stage. Can all of you still hear me? How can you see and hear me? I see you, yes, Fair you're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a, a glitch on my end here. It's you've taken us like a good storyteller right to the edge of the brink of the crisis. Uh, I mean, you, you're talking about taking over a, a college which has no cash reserves, a big deficit, uh, a board being censured for making bad decisions, no endowment, um, and in a, a really, really stressful moment for higher education as a whole. So l let me ask you the quick question, and then I want to get out of the way and ask everybody else for their questions, which is, what did you do? What <laughs> bring it back from the brink? What are so, you? I, I studied about a dozen or more colleges that were struggling and that closed or that um, tried to successfully turn around. And I talked to a number of presidents and other individuals. And I really wanted to understand what are the you know what are the best practices in higher ed turnarounds. There's a great little book on higher ed turnarounds that if you search for it, there's only one that you'll find. Sure. Um, sure. There the um, uh, in fact, Goddard was mentioned in there as a successful turnaround story <laughs> from its past struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, and so when I looked at it, I realized that one of the things that we we needed to do is is we we didn't have enough money to make it through the year, and we had a staff that was the size for 600 students, and we only had less than 400 at the time. So this is never popular, it's never fun, but we had to align our staff size with the number of students that we have. Oh. Um, no, no institution, unless it's highly endowed, can operate unless it has some kind of variable financial model, meaning that the 
expenses go up and down with the size of the enrollment. If you have a fixed cost for staff and faculty and everything, and it stays there, whether your enrollment goes up and down, the only way you can operate that way is if you had a really, you know, a really significant endowment that just insulated you from those things all the time. Um, so, um, so one of the things we did is we had to reduce, um, and we reduced our expenses by thirty percent. That wasn't even enough though, because we're a unionized organization. Wait, wait. Did you say thirty percent? Thirty percent. Yeah, we're a unionized organization, and um, there are uh, severance agreements. Yeah. So even with reducing that, um, some people were eligible for three up up to six months in severance in some cases. Yeah. So even when we made the decision, we were still spending that money for three to six months in the future. So we had to raise money in the short term, and we did a small campaign that raised like between six and seven hundred thousand dollars that addressed some of the gap. But I was really committed to not doing a massive multi-million dollar campaign until we stabilized things because I wanted to be able to go to major donors and say, when you give your money, we have a model that's sustainable and we're going to make good use of that money to amplify the mission of Goddard in the world and to serve students and support our faculty and, and, and just really turn this into the incubator for educational experimentation that it's always been in the past. Mm. Um, mm. And so uh, we actually, we, we balanced, we, we finished last fiscal year then. Um, so within seven months, we went from a $1.4 million or 1.2, depending on how you count it, um, deficit to a balanced budget in seven months. And then today we have a $300,000 cash reserve. Yeah. Um, now, I believe that our best chance, we have to have two to $4 million probably by, um, by September, October for our best chance for the accreditors to let us stick around or let us uh, remain accredited because that's our three to six month cash reserve. Okay. So in January, I launched a two to $4 million, a $4 million campaign called Together for Goddard. And um, we didn't launch it though until almost a year into the turnaround because um, I mean, major donors typically don't want to fund closing a college. They're not going to give a million dollars for you to close elegantly. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so we've been doing a lot of that work and we have to build some trust because to, to, we've had these incidents in our past enough. Uh, some people are talking about give Goddard a second chance. This is probably fourth or fifth chance for us in some ways. So uh, we have a little bit of the um, of, of that to, to work through. Um, so it's been it's been really fascinating. In some ways, it really comes down to the basics, though. Uh, the parts that are going to be very hard is we're going to have to be taking a really deep, close look at our academic model and determine which aspects of it is fin or which aspects are financially viable and which are not, um, because um, when you're a small college. Uh, Oftentimes, you say you have faculty, and maybe there's a faculty member that's full time, but half of their load is actually not working with students. It's some other uh, release for another project. Yeah. And we're going to have to look really closely at all those release times and things like that, because sometimes those those interfere with trying to get to a variable model versus a fixed uh, a fixed model versus a, a variable model. Uh, well, thank you for being so candid and, and, and clear. Uh, mm -hmm. What a spectacular and, and very, very hard process to go through. And you're just starting the process. You have this campaign to fulfill. Uh, let, me, let me ask everybody else, uh, please. Um, I'd love to hear from your questions. And again, if, if your uh, camera is on and your microphone is on and you'd like to join us up here on stage, just click the raised hand button and I'll beam you up. Uh, and if you prefer to type in a question, just type in the question mark and uh, I'll be glad to hear from you. Again, we, we've hit a bunch of different issues already, everything from uh, enrollment management to online presence to uh, union uh, struggles to the basic math of a budget to dealing with an accreditor and a board. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions and thoughts. And if, if your question is, please tell me more, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, if you want to come back to ask them about one particular point, that's completely valid. So while everybody's thinking about that, while people are, are, are thinking, typing, getting ready to click the button so they can appear on stage with us, uh, let, let, me, let me ask you uh, a related question, which is um, you're in a state that's a, a very rural state, um, and it's a state that has lost three colleges in the past uh, five years. Um, What's the, how does the Vermont situation impact you? I mean, is the state government helpful? Have you partnered with other colleges, universities, or nonprofits, or towns? 
Um, we we do have some partnerships with organizations, uh, and we're going to be deepening that. One the got the in some ways Goddard was it. it it's um, it grew in the soil, New England soil. It was really um, a heart a heartbeat of Central Vermont in some ways, and um, as it's kind of uh, become smaller over the years, its residential program disappeared, things like that. There's been more d disengagement with the community, but still, the little town of Plainfield of a few thousand people, probably a third of the the residents are Goddard alums. The fire station was started by Goddard students. I mean, because <laughs> we didn't believe in in uh, we didn't believe in extracurricular activities. We thought that there should be no separation between life and learning. So if you want to do something, do it in the world. So they'd start a fire station or a health clinic or something like that. Um, so we need so we have some work. But one of the things we actually just launched is um, one of the ways I was looking at addressing the financial issue is selling some of our assets, our resources. But right before I arrived, we had um, we had. Uh, taken out a loan right before I started, um, a $2 million loan for a heating plant, a wood chip heating plant. It's pretty cool. I mean, we heat the entire campus and it produces the same emissions as two home wood burning stoves. Oh. Um, and, and that's really neat. And we were given a, a couple of awards for some of our work. We have a negative carbon footprint campus. Wow. Um, but uh, that's a loan. And the one thing that happened is we got it with um, the lender. Um, the entire campus was put as collateral for that loan which meant that I couldn't sell a portion of the campus. Whoa. So um, uh, we did 75 acres. We were looking at selling it to someone who wanted to put it in conservation with really fit with our values a lot, but that option fell through. And this is one of the lessons, by the way, of when you're in a turnaround, um, it is like playing a cosmic game of whack-a-mole. I mean, there are things that pop up and disappear more quickly than you can imagine. And if one comes in with a strict plan, uh, one has to be ready to revise that plan two to three times a week sometimes. Oh. So what we did though, is we switched to a rental strategy where we had a number of dorms back from our residential days that were unused. And we just released um, uh, about a, a few weeks ago, an announcement of the of what we're calling the Goddard College Village for Learning Initiative, which, which is an invitation for other like-minded uh, progressive education um, organizations to come and rent space at a low reasonable price and to join us on campus so that we can build a synergy of like-minded groups. And of course, we get the benefit of sometimes people will start in one group and they'll transfer to us. One example is the Vermont Center for Integrative Herbalism, where a lot of people travel from around the world to become um, uh, herbalists. Uh, mm -hmm. They now can come on campus. They're going to be renting space. They can get their their training as an herbalist and they can transfer right into our sustainability program if they want to. So we've, we, uh, we've been looking at those kinds of efforts. Well, that's great. Uh, we, uh, questions are flooding in. Uh, so let me just put in a couple of these to give you a sense of this. And if, friends, if you're new to uh, the forum, this is how the environment works. Uh, so first of all, we have a good question from Jessica Serdan who asks, have you been approached by larger colleges to merge? We've got to do that. Um, we have, uh, in my first four or five months, I spent a lot of time looking at merger options. And uh, most of the colleges that successfully are acquired, um, and people use the word merger because it sounds more democratic, but it's almost always an acquisition. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, um, um, there, uh, there was very little interest because we have no assets. In many cases, uh, if you acquire a struggling college, you still get a 10, 20, 30 million dollar endowment that you get to bring along or something else like that. Yeah. Our whole, um, our entire campus is, has an estimated value of about six million, but in central Vermont on the market, it may sell for, for half that, who knows? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so the, the idea of someone acquiring us, it would have to be done just out of this incredible sense of, of uh, passion for our mission and wanting to see it live. And, and most colleges are interested in, I mean, they're not in a position to be able to do that right now. But I have had conversations with about a half a dozen different colleges um, during the time that were never got to a really serious stage. Um, and people were definitely happy to take all of our students if we close. But the idea of acquiring the college um, was of less interest to most of the people that we talked to. I'll, I'll tell you, for example, with two presidents I talked to, they said, we would actually be quite interested in this if you make it through these challenges. In other words, we'd be interested in an acquisition, but you have to you have to survive for the next couple of years first. Um, so, because I mean, just that's just the reality of higher, the higher ed landscape right now, taking on a liability. Um, 
uh, and justifying that to your board? Why did you take on a liability that might have millions of dollars of expenses rather than using those millions to invest in some new initiative at your college? Yeah. That's kind of a hard sell to many boards. That's a good point. Uh, Jessica, thank you for coming right up with that. Um, we have another question here. Uh, this is coming from Cindy mm -hmm. in Portland State, who asks the big question, what impact do you think the current COVID-19 crisis will have on Goddard? Great question. We have um, our last residency for this this semester is scheduled to be in, we have a, um, a couple of locations in Washington State and one in Seattle um, and one in, in Fort Warden in Port, um, um, Fort Warden in um, Port Townsend, Washington. And that was scheduled to start uh, on the 20th of this month. So we actually just made the announcement last night to our students that we were going to be uh, moving that residency online. Now, our residencies, again, are more like a conference. So it's going to be very different from other schools when they say they're moving their activities online. Yeah. All of our interactions with students post-residency are already virtualized. So we already have all those systems in place, but um, we are moving that residency to a virtual format. So it's tough because it's our Master of Fine Arts and Interdisciplinary Arts, and they're into movement. I mean, there are a lot of ballet dancers and people doing other things, so it's hard to do that on screen. But um, if anyone can do it, it will be this group. It's an incredibly creative group of mixed uh, media artists. Um, so for us, um, I'm not sure about the long-term impact. We'll be monitoring this over the upcoming weeks to determine what impact it is. Our next residency doesn't start until July. So we have some time to organize our, our thinking about that. In the meantime, we actually had released a, um, an announcement to all of our staff encouraging them to work for home, from home, expanding our remote working policy. Uh, most of our meetings are already via Zoom or other video conferencing tools. Um, and uh, our faculty actually, uh, we don't have any faculty who are on campus all the time. Most of them live on the West Coast or East Coast and fly in for residencies. So we already have um, quite a bit of experience working in a, a virtualized environment. In some ways, this gives us evidence to prove um, how we can operate as a very completely different model of uh, online learning, in a sense. Um, because, I, in fact, one of the things that I'm hoping to do, granted that we make it through the immediate challenges, I'm starting a digital futures um, uh, work group, and we're researching what does it look like to create a uh, virtual or digital expression of a truly learner-driven environment that's not course-based or instructor-driven. And, um, and so we're actually in some ways going to be able to experiment with that a little bit uh, in this crisis. It sounds ironic. Thank you. the best position in college or university to do this in the US? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that, but we're going <laughs> to we're going to do the best we can with it. Um, I the competition in the online space is interesting. Most of the people who come to Goddard aren't interested in a fully online degree. Um, the, the population that we draw, they want to have these intensive in person connections with the freedom in between. Mm. Uh, mm. But uh, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that there are plenty of people who probably are looking for what we have to offer and they end up going to an online school. We don't have a budget uh, that can compete directly in terms of the digital ad space. So regardless of COVID-19 and, and uh, um, whether we're virtual or stay low residency, um, I believe that our strategy for growth is really going to come through strategic partnerships. That's where we, we actually get over 10% of our students every semester come from our existing partnerships. That's really important to see. We're learning a great deal, friends, uh, but we have more questions that are coming in. And in fact, mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, a great question coming in from uh, Dennis. Uh, is it Solnier, Dennis? Yeah, yes, it is. Hi, Brian. Hey, great so to see you. <laughs> Bernard, really nice to see you. Yeah. Um, so my question is, I was reminded uh, of this recently. There was just a, a great Future You podcast interview with the president of Dominican University. She talked about the role um, her accreditors played in strategic in innovation, being really supportive and collaborative. Can you, can you say a little bit about the role accreditors are playing with you and it, um, how good a partner they are with you? Yes, thank you. And um, 
And, and by the way, it's really good to see you, Dennis. Uh, I got to know Dennis at the little work at Harvard Business Publishing back in your previous work. Um, but uh, um, I, I actually watched that episode as well. I, I, I loved it. In fact, I had to pull over and take some notes. I thought it was a great, great conversation. Um, I would say that the New England Commission on Higher Education is a completely different experience with accreditation from where I came from the Midwest with the Higher Learning Commission. Right. Higher Learning Commission is very large, and I'm, this is not meant to be a negative, it's just, it doesn't feel quite as personal or intimate, but in the, in the New England space, uh, I went to my first accreditation conference and I was, I thought I was on a different planet because I started going to sessions and I was used to sessions like how to fill out this portion of your self-study. I mean, that's what I had experienced in the past. And I got to, to the New England uh, Commission meeting, annual meeting, and it was about college mergers and uh, future innovations and practices. And it was very forward thinking and collaborative. And, um, and it truly is is a collective. So the commission doesn't feel like just this oversight body. It's a collection of, of colleges and people reach out and they help each other. And certainly the Vermont colleges separate from the, the accreditors uh, have been very helpful and supportive. Um, we were a recent crisis we had even in our, our records um, system, a bunch of the presidents volunteered different personnel that came in to helped us uh, solve a problem. The, I will say the president, the current president of the New England Commission on Higher Education, Barbara Brittingham, who's retiring, is incredible. She has been an amazing uh, supporter. Um, they give rough draft feedback. I'm not used to that. I'm used to kind of submitting work. It's like a final assignment, and then you just wait to see what the grade is. Yeah. But they'll actually work with you and say, hey, I think you need to beef this up, even if it's just you need more numbers here or something. <laughs> um, uh, I can reach out to the president of the New England Commission, and um, I, I've never, it has never taken more than two hours for me to get a reply from the president of the commission when I've had a question or a concern. Um, she's been a thought partner in times of, of challenge. Now, there are limits to this, of course. I mean, uh, they're looking out for the best interest of the students, and as a result, uh, I came in and I was really wanting to be able to launch new initiatives and new programs and grow enrollment quickly. And there wasn't strong support for that. In fact, the goal, was, the, the interest was more prove that you can be stable with your current enrollment and your current programs before there's going to be greater comfort seeing you step into the innovation space. Um, and that some people see that as having your hands tied behind your back. I actually saw it as a pretty responsible stance or position. Why would we, because uh, because there are plenty of colleges that grow their way into financial crisis, that they grow their enrollment rapidly and they do it through discounting and other unsustainable strategies only to find that their enrollment's twice as large and their deficit is twice as big. Um, and um, and so the creditors have, have held a firm hand where I think they should, but they've also been a great thought partner. Um, I, I don't know if it was quite as deep of, it's been as quite as deep of a partnership as what I heard in that interview, the way it was described, but maybe we're just at a different stage in our turnaround work. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, that's a great question. And uh, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's how a video question works. It's really, really easy to do. Um, and we can please join us with, with more such questions. Mm. Uh, over on Twitter, there are a couple of notes. Um, you have uh, a few different fans. Um, we have uh, one from, uh, let's see, uh, Online Course Lady said, uh, thank you to Bernard for being one of the world's most awesome bloggers and for sharing the web in all the different spaces. Uh, she'd be glad to talk to you in here and learn more about you. Um, and also people are fond of your comment that campuses have lots of ways to grow into financial crisis. Uh, we have more questions that have come in on text, and we just put up a couple of these. Uh, Zach Schlosser asks, are you open to external folks supporting your digital futures research? Absolutely. I um, Obviously, f managing our budget and coming in below budget is critical for us every year. So um, we don't have the resources currently to pay for people to step in. But I actually had one instructional design firm reach out and say, hey, I'd love to help and do it pro bono, even be a part of this, because I think it's a fascinating work. And maybe it can be a synergy because the what we get to because most people haven't had a chance to work in a truly learner driven environment. And we are that. Um, so yeah, definitely openness to that. And I'm, that 
that work group is going to be gaining traction in April. So it's good timing to pose that question. Well, Zach, uh, uh, please to reach out to you. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys could connect. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we do in the future transform is that we, we bring people together. Um, and I'm really glad to see that happen. Uh, we have more questions coming in. And this is one from uh, Nate uh, Sukolnik, uh, who asks a kind of general question about strategy and administration. How best can administrators in colleges work with professors to better manage and plan a budget for the classroom? And yeah. what you've learned is really primal for this. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I don't know about the classroom part. That, that last part of the question throws me a little bit because this environment is so different. We don't have classrooms. <laughs> um, so um, I do think this is actually an area where we have some room for growth and improvement. One of the things that is tricky about a turnaround effort, as I'm sure everyone would expect, is you have to make decisions really quickly. And yet we're a community that has a strong democratic value background. I've made some missteps where I've had to move too quickly and I wanted to be able to engage people more. We had to build a, a new strategic plan. When I arrived, there was no strategic plan in place. We had to build a strategic plan in less than three months. Um, so there's only so much input that you can get. Um, we did get some input. The spending part is tricky. Um, in some ways, I don't know if I, if I think it's, ideal for faculty to have to be thinking about the expense side all the time. And in some ways, I'd rather there be a healthy, respectful tension where faculty are pushing for what they believe is most important um, apart from finances, although there has to be some kind of sense of realism, what's, what's possible. Um, and that there are others that are also saying, yes, we agree with this academic quality and, and creating the best possible experiment experience, but we have to do it within certain parameters in order to be uh, uh, in order to continue to be able to operate. And um, what I what I most value about our context right now, and this doesn't, it's not an answer that's as generalized as the question was, is in our context, we've made a lot of missteps and people have called administration out on it. And I will step up and say, I'm sorry, I messed up. How do we fix this? How do we move forward? Um, and, and yet what I love about it is this is a community where no one's running out of the room. Like we're actually staying in and we're disagreeing with each other and we're persisting until we can find some answers. So to me, that is a really beautiful and important part of the process is the fact that we're sticking with each other. We don't have to turn everything into a personal attack. We understand that there can be differences and tensions and we keep, uh, we keep moving through it. Uh, I will say that um, uh, we are exploring a variety of work groups, though, to help address some of these. One of the innovations that's really intriguing to me that came from the faculty, the faculty came together and said, how do we do this in a way that's sustainable financially but really fits our values? And one idea that came up was we have all of these, these different programs, but oftentimes our faculty have qualifications to advise across disciplines. So what if we move to an all-college faculty where students, where you, you don't have faculty just hidden within individual divisions or departments as much. And that way, if enrollment's high in one program and low in another, you don't have to lay off a faculty member. You can kind of just shift some roles and responsibilities. And at the same time, it creates some really cool synergies for interdisciplinary projects um, across, across programs. Oh. Um, so I, I think I, I maybe went off on a little aside with that question, but um, I was... Uh, I was inspired by the question to at least answer the way I did. <laughs> well, it's a good aside. And, and thank you, Nate, for the, for the good question. Um, <clears throat> more depth, a lot of depth to be plumbed here. Uh, speaking of which, we have a question from, uh, let's see, this is from Freedom Chitani, who asks, what is the future of VR in education? We're seeing VR high schools in California. Yeah, we, we certainly have not ventured into that at Goddard. That's not that's not really a, a technology. I, my prior work, we actually had a little work team that got into VR a little bit, and we had some people working on it, but haven't done much um, uh, haven't done much with it here. I do think there could be some really interesting possibilities for um, the way that we host residencies because it's not really in a course environment. It's much more of uh, like I said, more of a conference kind of feel and uh, virtual reality could really lend itself toward creating some really rich multi-sensory um, interactions. 
Um, we have a lot of people in our community who are into embodiment studies and this understanding that we learn through our bodies, not just through kind of uh, um, what's behind our, or between our ears. And, um, and so physical movement is a really important piece of the experience. And that's going to be a fascinating conversation as we, th as we think about the possibility of what that looks like in a virtualized environment. It's a great question. Uh, Freedom, do you want to say more about that? <clears throat> yeah. So I think I think if you look at you know what's happening today, uh, VR is is the future really uh, in terms of you know being able to uh, maintain that social interaction, the social aspect of education. I mean, if you think about everyone going online today, you know well, we're struggling about our own evolution and existence. I feel like mm -hmm. we are on the precipice of our own evolution as a species, you know, where mobile devices are a natural extension of ourselves. But with VR, the only difference now is that um, you are interacting with avatars, but the technology is only going to get better and better. And with the uh, with arrival of 5G, um, and the convergence of all these other technologies, we would not be able to separate, you know, reality from uh, the virtual world. Um, and so I think we need to prepare for that. Um, I think the uh, the COVID-19 is almost an, an awakening uh, to our species because we, we talked about it that someday we're going to wake up and we have not trained our students and our kids for the future, it just happened faster than I thought. I love your perspective, Freedom. That's fantastic. Um, Thank and, you. Um, Bernard, do you, do you want to make the leap from uh, talking about budgets to the, the species and how we train our students and perform a massive civilization shift? Through well, I will say, and this is not speaking directly to virtual reality, but it's something that, that um, I'll give just a little background here. Last time I was on the on this um, forum was actually um, um, two months before I started the job at Goddard, or maybe it was three months before. And if you actually go back and look at the recording, Brian, I made a reference to a school that intrigued me called Goddard College. It was because I had just been given the offer and I couldn't publicly say right. where I was in the decision, but it was, it was literally at that time. Um, a lot of my work, has been around um, what it means to create deeply human learning environments. And by deeply human, what I mean by that are um, environments that really tap into the values that resonate across time and culture in terms of the human experience. Mm. For example, a sense of adventure, being on a quest. It's something that transcends. We see that in narratives across time and, and culture. A sense of meaning and purpose, a sense of agency, um, a sense of wonder, uh, mystery, uh, this, this kind of being drawn to a sense of, of mystery, um, the desire to see some kind of growth or progress happening in our lives or in that around us, that these are these, are these really deeply human-centered principles. Um, I actually believe that part of the way that our contemporary education system has started to go off track is that we have set aside those deeply human values for technical values, um, values that are celebrated in the machine world. And these are values like mass production and mechanization. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I mean, there are, there are a series of them. And I, I'm not, um, I did write a little book about this, but I don't like pitching specific things. But um, <laughs> I, I use this example though of uh, oxygen, of, of breathing, that if you look at the symptoms of oxygen deficiency, uh, they're almost identical to the uh, the characteristics of a disengaged group of students in a classroom. They have difficulty managing their emotions, difficulty regulating their emotions. Um, they get bored easily. They get irritable. Um, uh, uh, they fall asleep. I mean, it's literally the kind of thing that we see in some disengaged learning environments. And um, I would argue that's because we built the environment around values that are good for machines, but not good for humans. And so to me, what intrigues me about a technology like uh, virtual reality 
is that perhaps it's a way for us to uh, bring those together in some in some new pieces. <laughs> we can create some environment. Uh, we can we can leverage the technology to do new things, but we can build it in such a way that it taps into those really deeply human yearnings, like a sense of adventure and meaning and purpose and wonder and mystery and growth and. Uh, those sorts of things. Um, part of the reason I mentioned this is Goddard is actually a place that that majors in those human values. Um, it's a community. That's why we don't have letter grades. Letter grades are largely a mechanized approach to assessing learning. Um, and a grade doesn't really tell you much, nor does a number. Um, and we are more interested, I, I'm far more interested in measuring the amount of seconds that a, a hug takes place in our graduation yes. ceremony because it demonstrates a level of connection than I, you know, in some of those other measures. So I think VR could be a really humanizing and empowering tool. I think it also could be a dehumanizing um, force if we allow it as well. Yeah, I'm a, I believe that it's a, it's a humanizing technology. I think <laughs> if you can humanize technology and integrate it, you know, into the values and the things that make us who we are, as human beings. Um, and I think there has to be a responsible design of these technologies. Um, if you think about the industrial model of education, what we had was uh, we were preparing factory workers. It was that age. But now we are in this autonomous age, in the personalized age, you know, like where your device alone knows exactly where you're going and when because it's looking at all those parents. Um, so the convergence of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and blockchain is going to bring us all into this phase, uh, this singularity, if you may say, where there is a period of hyper-connectivity. Um, I mean, I believe that, you know, in the next 15 years, you know, we'll be having, you know, the brain to brain communication uh, where our brain is effectively connected to the cloud. Um, you know, the computers that we have today, the phones that we have today, they will be dematerialized. Um, learning will be happening anywhere, anytime and everywhere. Um, it to be a situation where you could essentially, you know, if you know, if it was look, if you're looking at, let's say, AR, yeah. you could you could just say, take me onto this um, uh, tourist mode, and then virtual guides show up, uh, and then this building spill their history and things like that. Take me to education mode. Um, then you know you're able to map those standards and the skills that are personalized to you. Um, so you can switch into all these different modes uh, and it's intricately integrated into your life. So there is no longer um, a separation of your personal life and your academic life and your work life. It's all happening together. Freedom. I believe that's the future. That's a fantastic vision. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it. I would love to hear more about this. We're, 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 appreciate, we're approaching the end of the hour. So I, and I have another fellow I want to bring up on stage. But thank you so much, Freedom. Thank and you. You're welcome. Thank you're welcome. you for, uh, for envisioning that together. Uh, we have uh, Bill Hughes as well uh, from uh, Open for Learning. Bill. Hey, Brian. Hi, Bernard. Thank you so much. This has been a delight to listen to. Um, I'm curious, Bernard, um, maybe it's the last question if we're running out of time. Um, where do you see Goddard in five years and how do you feel like you have to get there? And uh, you talked a little bit about stabilizing first and then moving. I'd love to understand where you're going and also how you're going to navigate the COVID um, landmine standing right in front of you right now. Right. Thank you. So um, right now we have the, I believe we've we've done all the things we need to do to have a successful turnaround with a couple of exceptions. One is we still need some tweaking to our academic model and the financial model just to make, to make sure that it's, uh, we don't need to reduce our expenses as much as we need them to be more predictable um, and manageable so that we know what's coming so we, we're not surprised by expenses and that's a common problem in many higher ed landscapes it's just whenever you're in a situation like ours there is no room for 
uh, that kind of messiness. You have to have a detailed yeah. understanding of each piece, right? So for, my, for us, that's a real critical immediate piece. And then I also need to build the cash reserves. If we don't build the cash reserves, I don't think I have a very good chance with the accreditors come September, yeah. October. We have a April 20th site visit. And if that goes well, um, I think the best that could happen is, I mean, if I get a $2 million gift tomorrow, um, maybe you, I don't know how many millionaires you have in here, Brian. But <laughs> if, um, Got it. if I get a $2 million gift tomorrow, I feel really confident about our future. I feel like, mm -hmm. and we've done everything we need to do. And so let's assume that that, that happens because um, I, I should say this, and I would feel guilty if I didn't say this. I, I feel really proud of the work that we've done as a community, but it's high risk. And there is, I took this job knowing that it may, I may succeed or fail. And, um, and uh, there's, it's definitely not a 90% chance of success yet. This fundraising is, is so key. But if we make it through this piece and we, we hit that financial target and the accreditors agree with the model that we've created, uh, we have April 20th visit, we'll probably hear from them by September, October. Um, okay. I've already talked to the community and um, I'm asking that every year we're gonna have a series of three to five key new initiatives, experiments, proposals around uh, new innovations. Uh, one of them is uh, a dream that Goddard College will become the uh, the hub for integrative medicine in New England and beyond. We already have a lot of interesting background in that, and I'm expecting to see some proposals in areas, tie that into the national healthcare conversations. It's a part of the conversation that's really not as central as it could be, and it could be a way of reducing costs while improving well-being and outcomes. Oh. If you get to some of an alternative perspectives. I do believe, and I want to be part of the first truly learner-driven digital learning platform in existence because I haven't seen one yet um, in a formal higher ed environment, at least. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that we will be able to have the resources and the time to launch that. And to tell the truth, I, I want to do it at Goddard, but even if, mm -hmm. if it doesn't happen at, God happen at Goddard, um, I don't think I could let go of that one. I feel like sometime in my lifetime, I want to be part of the movement that builds the first truly learner-driven digital learning platform. Mm -hmm. um, those those are two key pieces. The third is this village of learning that we're launching. I believe that the, the strongest organizations of the future will be blurring the lines between organizations, that there will be a kind of synergy in interacting with and supporting one another such that you, it, you sometimes don't even know when one organization begins and another one ends. And that's kind of the vision between behind our village of learning is bringing this community of different organizations together where we can amplify one another's works in ways that none of us expected or anticipated. Thank you so much. That's exciting. I hope you get there. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, and I hope they give you some, uh, some grace in April too. If you've got interest um, pointing to successful uh, summer of fundraising, then I think you're in a, gonna be in a good situation. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Good thoughts, Bill, and great question. And uh, what a great visionary answer, Bernard. Um, I, I I hate to say it, but we're we're right at the end of the hour. Um, let, let, let me ask you two two parting questions. Uh, one is, um, what note do you want to leave us on? Is, is this this is a hopeful note about a, a college on the brink that has just turned itself around and aimed at a bright future? Um, I, I'd like to actually uh, offer a, a less pleasant uh, <laughs> closing remark, um, which is uh, I, I believe so strongly in what we're doing. I mean, I left a really nice role and really safe kind of place in my lifestyle. I was working on my next three books. One of the downsides of this is I have a book that's due to the publisher, and I've never missed a publishing deadline, and I've missed uh, the deadline twice on a book, uh, my, one oh. of my new books called Learning Beyond Letter Grades. It's a critique of the letter grade system. Um, so yeah, there are some sacrifices here. I've been apart from my family a lot. That There have been some huge sacrifices. And I would encourage people to count the cost before they step into a role like this. It's amazing. It's life-changing. I'm so honored to be part of it. But it is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I can't emphasize that enough. And I've been through some pretty major issues in my life. And I will say that if we don't make it, I don't have a great plan. And I think that's a that's an important part. I arrived realizing that there was no elegant way to close this college. That really the best way for the best interest of everyone, students and everyone involved, is to actually be successful. That we don't have cash reserves, we don't have an endowment. We don't